Uh, I wanted to welcome everybody to our talk today. We're, we were, had the opportunity in the last couple of minutes to get to get to know Jim a little bit and really excited to hear what he has to say. I think it's going to fit very well into our current environment of the virus, the, the political activities going on in the recent spat going on here in Houston with the Chinese embassies. So I think it's, it's going to be really good. Let me take a moment, if I could, and introduce you to the Silver Foxes. So Doug, if you go to the next slide, please. Some of you may wonder who the Silver Foxes are. Some of you may have attended a lot of these lunches and uh, uh, this will be a little redundant, but uh, we are an association of proven business leaders. And honestly, we spent a lot of time, and a lot of energy focused on our mission here to serve the greater Houston area of small business, small businesses and nonprofit organizations. All our energy is to help them grow and prosper and to use the collective wisdom within the organization through service offerings and individual engagement to help them succeed. As I mentioned, we have a lot of very robust service offerings. I'm highlighting uh, several of them here. Uh, we're, very, we're very excited to do our CEO roundtables, uh, about 20 across the greater Houston area. Uh, pretty consistent uh, activity. We, we meet about once a month. What's interesting is during the COVID time, uh, a lot of the tables have agreed to meet weekly. And so we, we've gone virtual. We meet weekly. We try to solve real-time problems. And as you can imagine, for a lot of small businesses, a month is like multiple years. And so we squeeze that down now into me weekly meetings. I'm going to highlight at the end of our talk today a lot of things that we do with education forms, the lunch and learn, we consider that. When we do do it in person, it's not only educational, it's a networking opportunity, but now it's, it's just more education. We have advisory board services, both as a one-time event, and that is someone, a business owner that has an issue, will put together a panel of people that have experience and can add some value to a discussion. And we'll meet with that business owner over a couple hour period and really help them think through the alternatives and, the, and help them wrestle with how to solve their problem. We also have started a new service that uh, we'll put together a team that will become a continuous advisory board. So reach out to us. And the last area, as I mentioned, is we do do individual uh, advising, both as a mentor, as a consultant, as a coach, whatever word you'd like to use it. I've really learned it to be become the, the personal confidant of the leader of a business and help them, again, go through their, their issues. I want to give you a highlight of what we've been up to. Uh, although we seem like we've now been stuck in front of our computers doing Zoom-type things, uh, we've actually used this period to really push our mission into the community. As I mentioned, we have a very active CEO roundtable program. In most cases, it's now almost a weekly event versus a monthly event. We've hosted a webinar uh, just yesterday, and there was over like 59 people that attended it. It is our second webinar in about uh, six, uh, 60 days in our CEO educational series. Again, the prior one, about 50 or 60 people showed up. We've done several other webinars during this time frame. And I think we've ultimately have interacted with maybe about three, 300, 350 people. One of those webinars was with the United Way. And from that, they've asked us to put together a roundtable dedicated to their members. So again, we're not just focused on the for-profit in the uh, aspects of the, of the Houston area, we're focused on the nonprofits too. And uh, the CEO roundtable is being developed now and we'll see how that plays out. This is the educational series that I just referenced, the CEO education series. We've had uh, two, two sessions already on customer acquisition. Um, a lot of that was how, to, how, do, how do you maintain your, your customers during the COVID shutdown? And then as you're reopening, and hopefully we can stay reopened, uh, you know, how do you get those customers back and serve their needs? And then uh, on the earlier this week, we had a session on how to drive results in your business through financial drivers. And again, they've been pretty successful. We've had 50 or 60 people at both of these. We have two more coming up in the future, one in August about organizational effectiveness, and then the last one on processes and systems. 
We felt these are the four key subjects this year to really help businesses get through the COVID. What I'd like to do is ask my colleague, uh, Melvin, to introduce James for us and uh, get us, get, allow James to get on with his talk. So Melvin, if you would, please. Thanks, Bill. I've known Jim for 10 or 15 years through many speaking engagements, which I've heard him provide. Uh, the first thing I think you should know is that you can believe what he tells you about the graduates of Texas A&M that he tries to recruit because he's a graduate of the University of Iowa, been in the U.S. Navy, and was recruited after uh, completing law school by a clandestine secret phone call that asked him to meet uh, at a certain place at a certain time, and that, that was it. And he showed up turned out to be the CIA, and 30 years later, he ends up at A&M. So I can believe what he says. I understand one of the things he learned very quickly is that a running shower is not a deterrent to people listening to what you don't want them to hear from your uh, apartment or bedroom. Yeah. So be careful what you do if you're worried about it. Uh, when he uh, decided to leave the CIA, he had to tell his parents and his in-laws what he'd been doing because he spent tours uh, in Paris, France, and in Italy, and in Russia, and they all seemed to think that he just was unable to hold a consistent job because he shifted so often. <laughs> they were relieved to learn what he'd been doing and why he shifted around. So Jim uh, is very capable of mixing humor with his dangerous experiences and I know you're going to enjoy what you hear today. Jim, it's your turn. Thank you very much, Melvin, for that kind introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for being here. Our topic is very timely and very important because our country, ladies and gentlemen, faces a grave danger that it is not taking seriously enough. Now, I welcome the opportunity to talk today about counterintelligence and to say a few words about my new book, To Catch a Spy, The Art of Counterintelligence. My first book, Fair Play, The Moral Dilemmas of Spying, dealt with the dilemmas we face in the world of spying. Things like targeted killings, torture, kidnappings, blackmail overthrowing unfriendly governments and seduction. But the subject of To Catch a Spy is different. It's treason. And that's our topic today, specifically Americans who have betrayed our country by selling out to a foreign intelligence service. And few Americans realize the extent to which foreign intelligence services are stealing our secrets and technology, right here at home, right under our noses, right in Houston, Texas. Let me give you my bottom line up front. I don't like traitors. I don't like Americans who betray our country for money, ego, sex, or any other reason. Counterintelligence refers to all the steps a country takes to prevent foreign intelligence services from stealing its secrets, pirating its technology, and hacking into its computer databases. Next slide, please. Thank you, sweetheart. The first chief of counterintelligence in our country was George Washington. George Washington said, there is one evil that I dread, and that is their spies. I think it is a matter of some importance to prevent them from obtaining intelligence of our situation. George Washington was ahead of his time in understanding how dangerous spies are and how vitally important it is to catch him. No, not the next slide yet. Good, thank you. My job as Chief of Counterintelligence at the CIA was to find spies and to bring them to justice. Perhaps the most difficult task in the whole field of intelligence. Now, please don't misconstrue what I'm about to say now. 
but I've always been fascinated with evil. The first serious paper I ever wrote was a high school essay comparing Milton's Satan with Shakespeare's Iago, both case studies, I thought, of pure evil. And as a boy, I devoured the Sherlock Holmes stories. I suspect there are some other Sherlock Holmes fans out in our audience today. And by far the most intriguing character for me was Holmes' nemesis, the evil genius Professor Moriarty. So even as a teenager, I was asking myself, what is it that makes a person capable of such terrible crimes? How low can a person sink into depravity? How dark can the human soul become? I didn't realize it back then, of course, but in my CIA career, I would one day find out. Because in my 31 years at the CIA, I saw evil face to face more often than I care to remember. People I knew and trusted, people I considered friends, betrayed us, and their treachery was close to me. It was personal. And it was indescribably painful. The damage these traitors did to our country was absolutely devastating. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got to stop these spies. America is losing its secrets and its sensitive technologies. Too many Americans, sadly, it turns out, can be bought. And with few exceptions, Americans spy for money. My book is a call to arms to the United States government and to the American people to do more. I hope it will be a wake-up call to demand tighter security, to strengthen our nation's counterintelligence, and to hold criminally responsible those who sell or leak our secrets. In Dante's Inferno, the ninth and deepest circle of hell is reserved for traitors. I think that's exactly the right place for them. What I'd like to do now is to take you into the world of counterintelligence as I lived it. And there's probably no better way to do that than to share with you my personal experiences with four individuals who put greed and folly above their loyalty to our country. The title of my presentation is Traitors I Have Known. These cases and many others are in my book, but I've chosen these four because they illustrate, I think, the true nature of betrayal, why traitors do what they do, what damage they cause, and how we catch them. I'll be happy to answer any questions you have at the end about To Catch a Spy, about counterintelligence, about current events or anything else that's on your minds. So let's get into it now. Let's take a journey together into evil. Let's take an insider's look at what I consider the most heinous of all crimes, treason. Next slide, please. I first met Edward Lee Howard in 1980 when he was a 28-year-old trainee at our training facility in rural Virginia that we call the farm. My wife, Meredith, and I had just completed our own two-year undercover assignment in Moscow. My job back at headquarters was chief of Soviet operations. And I went down to the farm to assess the current crop of trainees down there. Now, I was looking for a candidate to send to Moscow for a very sensitive assignment. Our plan was to insert a clean young officer inside the U.S. Embassy in Moscow under deep cover in the hope that he would attract relatively little attention from the KGB. And the concept was a good one. The young officer, the young trainee we were looking for had to be a cool natural operator, someone with a real flair for clandestine work, someone who was resourceful, a quick thinker, 
He also had to be a great linguist because he was going to have to master Russian. So I looked at all the trainees and I consulted with my colleagues and it was unanimous. We picked Eddie Howard. Eddie was a graduate of the University of Texas. No comment. He had a master's degree in finance. He had served with the Peace Corps in Peru. His language aptitude scores were off the chart. And he ranked very high in his training class in surveillance detection and overall trade craft. We thought we had a winner. Eddie and his wife, Mary, sailed through the Advanced Denied Area Tradecraft course. This was the same specialized training that Mary and I had gone through just a few years earlier. It's tough. There's a lot of built-in stress. A lot of couples don't make it. Next, we brief Eddie on the operations he might be called upon to handle in Moscow, including several that I'd been involved in when I was there, both human operations and technical operations. By the summer of 1983, Eddie and Mary were ready to go to Moscow. But surprise, one last thing, an unexpected last minute polygraph exam. Mary did great, but Eddie bombed his. Turned out that Eddie who had admitted to using drugs in Peru, was using again. He also had a drinking problem that needed immediate attention. And there's another incident that came out on the polygraph that disturbed us. Eddie admitted that a short time earlier, when he was returning from Europe after a training mission that we had sent him on, he was very tired. He was trying to get some sleep on the plane. But a woman in the row ahead of him had a fussy baby. And poor Eddie couldn't sleep. So when this lady got up to take the baby back to the restroom, he reached through the seat, opened her purse, and stole $40 just to pay her back for disturbing him. Now, we didn't like that. First, it was illegal. It was a crime. But second, it showed a pettiness and a vindictiveness that we thought made Eddie Howard unsuitable for our sensitive kind of work. So when we added it all up, the drugs, the alcohol, and the petty theft, we didn't think we had a choice. We not only canceled Eddie's assignment to Moscow, we fired him. Eddie, Mary, and their infant son moved to New Mexico where Eddie got a job with the state government down there. But mostly he brooded and got into trouble. He was arrested in a bar fight. He was charged with pulling a 44 Magnum revolver in another fight. He was drinking heavily. But above all, he was burning with rage for what the CIA and the United States government had done to him. And he wanted revenge. And he got his revenge. In the fall of 1983, Eddie made contact with the KGB in Vienna, started telling the Russians everything he knew about CIA operations in Moscow. We know for certain that Howard betrayed one of the best agents we'd ever had in Moscow, maybe the best ever, a Soviet missile and avionics expert named Adolf Tokuchov. Next slide, please. Tokachev was a quiet, sincere gentleman who hated communism and everything it stood for. That's why he was risking his life by cooperating with us, his hatred of communism. He was identified by Howard, arrested by the KGB, interrogated, tortured, and executed. And make no mistake about it, Eddie Lee Howard killed him just as surely as if he personally had taken him to the basement of Lubyanka, put him on his knees, 
and fired the bullet through the back of his head, which is how Tokachev died. Next slide. Here's a picture of Tokachev's arrest. It is very painful for all of us in the CIA to look at. Losing an agent, particularly a valued one like Tokachev, is like a death in the family. And we were losing other agents as well. Howard also revealed to the KGB that the CIA had tapped a top secret Soviet underground communications cable. So we lost that incredibly valuable operation. And that was very personal for me because it happens that it was I who had gone down the manhole in Moscow to install that tap. 1985, a Soviet defector told us that a disgruntled former CIA officer was cooperating with the KGB. He didn't know the officer's name, but his description could fit only one person, Edward Lee Howard. And I can't begin to describe to you the anguish, the shock, and the anger that we all felt. The FBI put Eddie under surveillance in New Mexico, but he was too smart for them. He was too well-trained for them. With Mary's help, he used a technique that we had taught him called the jack-in-the-box to break the FBI surveillance and to escape to Russia. Next slide, please. The FBI put out a worldwide alert for Howard, but it was too late. He was gone. Next slide, please. Here's an excellent book on the Howard case, The Spy Who Got Away by David Wise. The inside story of Edward D. Howard, the CIA agent who betrayed his country's secrets and escaped to Moscow. Eddie was warmly received by the KGB. He was put up in a luxurious country home at Dacha on the outskirts of Moscow, where he lived by himself because Mary wanted no part of living in Russia. So there he was, alone, a traitor, a drunk, a man without a country. The KGB provided him with a steady stream of video games, American food, vodka, lots of it, and prostitutes. Next slide. Here's a picture of Howard in Moscow living the good life. In 2002, the Russian media reported that Russia's dear and heroic friend, the American spy Edward Lee Howard, age 51, had died of a broken neck in a fall down the back stairs of his dodge. Now, if any of you believe that, you might want to think again. My strong belief, and probably yours as well, is that Vladimir Putin just got tired of supporting this pathetic American slob and wanted the dacha for someone else. Next slide, please. It gets worse. I first met Aldrich Rick Ames in 1976 in New York. I was handling an important agent there, a KGB officer assigned to the United Nations, and Rick was working in our New York station. He was my local support. His job was to open the safe house, stock the refrigerator and bar, clean up afterwards. He was an odd jobs kind of guy. After my meetings with the KGB officer, Rick and I went out for dinner. He had expensive tastes. He liked Gallagher Steakhouse and the Oyster Bar in Grand Central Station. In the process, I got to know Rick well. A few years later, in 1985, Rick was working for me in counterintelligence. His job was to review all our Russian cases from a counterintelligence standpoint. 
To do that work, he had access to all the files. Now, I will say that Rick did some moderately useful counterintelligence work for us, but he was certainly not the counterintelligence genius that he thought he was. He was mediocre at best. In fact, he'd had disastrous tours in Accra and Mexico City with documented instances of drunkenness on the job, sleeping in the office, security lapses. Why we didn't get rid of him, I'll never know. I sure wish we had because he would have saved us a lot of anguish later on if we had. It was in Mexico City that Rick violated a major security regulation by sleeping with one of his agents, a Colombian woman named Rosario. Rick's marriage to his not wife Nan was breaking up and would eventually end in a bitter and for Rick very costly divorce. When Rick was reassigned from Mexico City to go back to Langley to CIA headquarters, guess what? He took Rosario with him. And as soon as his divorce was final, he and Rosario married. Next slide, please. This was not a marriage made in heaven. Rosario Ames was greedy, shrewish, and abusive. She constantly mocked Rick for his low salary and his inability to get promoted. She demanded a higher standard of living than Rick could afford on his government salary. So Rick was weak, he was harried, henpecked, and he was drinking more and more. In May of 1985, finally giving in to Rosario's relentless nag, Rick found a way to make a lot of money quickly. He approached a KGB officer in Washington and started selling him the names of our Russian agents. Next slide, please. Including this man, Dmitry Polyakov, a general in Russian military intelligence, the GRU, who had worked for us in the CIA for over 20 years. And like Tokachev, Polyakov was one of the best spies we'd ever had. I worked with Polyakov in Moscow. I knew him to be a decent, honorable man. I greatly admired and respected him. His motivation, like Tokachev's, was purely ideological. He wanted to fight back against the oppressive regime that he was serving. I'll never forget how this man, Polyakov, risked his life by transmitting encrypted top secret messages into Meredith's in my apartment in Moscow. He was a great spy. The executions of Tokachev, Polyakov, and our other Russian agents in Moscow were shattering for all of us who had known them and worked with them. And of course, we lost valuable sources of intelligence as a result. This was, without question, the lowest point in my CI career. From 1975 to 1985, the CIA built up an absolutely amazing inventory of Russian spies in Moscow. We owned them. We had penetrations of every Russian organization we cared about. In some cases, multiple penetrations, the KGB, the GRU, the Foreign Ministry, the Defense Ministry, and many others. We call those years the golden years of Moscow station operation. Next slide, please. Here's a photograph from that period taken inside the CIA station in Moscow. What you're seeing here is a celebration of a successful exfiltration operation we just pulled off. And the two happy spies in the right foreground are Meredith and Jim Olson. All of this came tumbling down in 1985 because of Rick Ames. 
he wiped us out, some 30 Russian agents. Eddie Howard had his role to play too, but most of our losses in Moscow by far were because of Rick, although we didn't know it at the time. It would take us nine years, in fact, to uncover Ames as a traitor and to get enough evidence to convict him. Meanwhile, Rick was finally able to give Rosario the lifestyle she wanted and thought she deserved. She ran up credit card bills of $20,000 a month. They bought this house, next slide please, for $540,000 for which they paid in cash. Next slide. Rick drove this car, for which he also paid cash. We estimate that Rick was paid at least $2.7 million by the Russians. It's inexcusable that it took us nine years to catch him, especially since he and Rosario were spending money far beyond their means. The Ames case rocked the CIA and the entire country. You may remember it. Next slide. Here's the cover of Time Magazine from that period, The Spy, a shocking tale of espionage, betrayal, and greed rocks the CIA. 1985 has gone down in the annals of the CIA as the most horrible year in our history because that's the year that Rick Ames wiped us out in Moscow and killed all of our agents. It's probably the Ames case more than anything else that caused me to write to catch a spy because I feel so strongly that we can never let anything like Rick Ames happen to us again. Next slide, please. Rick and Rosario Ames were arrested in 1994. They were both convicted of espionage. Rick was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Next slide. Back up. Back up. Back up. Rosario, the instigator and co-conspirator, served only four years under a plea bargain and is now living comfortably back in her native Columbia on KGB blood money that she stashed there before her arrest. By the way, if any of you are interested in getting in touch with Rick and letting him know what you think of him, I just happen to have his address. Next slide, please, Doug. You can reach him at that address. Next slide. Although I'd seen him around the U.S. Embassy in Vienna several times, the first time I actually spoke with Sergeant Clayton Lone Tree, United States Marine Corps security guard, was at the ambassador's Christmas party in December of 1986. Our ambassador in Vienna was the very wealthy Ronald Lauder, the son of a stay Lauder, the cosmetics magnate. And the Lauders entertained lavishly. It was a great party. Merith and I were having a very nice time. All the embassy staff had been invited. I was the CIA chief of station in Vienna. And toward the end of the evening, I noticed that this Marine guard, Sergeant Lone Tree, was watching me. As I moved to the next conversation group, he came over and intercepted me. I took him around the corner to a side room out of sight from the main party. This young man was shaking uncontrollably. I actually thought he was having some kind of a breakdown or some kind of episode. He could barely speak. But with difficulty, he finally said to me that he knew who I was because they had told him who I was. Well, they got my attention right away. 
they could only mean the KGB. Lone Tree said he had been a Marine Guard in Moscow before coming to Vienna, and he needed my help. He said he'd become involved with the KGB in Moscow and was under heavy pressure from the KGB now to do more in Vienna. He was scared. He wanted out. I didn't want to be seen spending much time with him at the party, so I gave him instructions to meet me the next day outside the embassy. And it didn't get, take long to get to the bottom of Lone Tree's story. He admitted to passing classified information to the KGB for money. It also turned out that he had a serious alcohol problem and had been seduced in Moscow by an attractive young Russian woman named Violetta who worked in our embassy in Moscow as a secretary and also, of course, as a KGB operative. Violetta was one of those well-trained seduction specialists the KGB calls swallows. Next slide, please. Clayton was an easy mark for the KGB. He was a Native American who felt he'd been discriminated against his entire life. His alcoholic mother had abandoned him on the reservation when he was a child. He had never had a successful, emotionally satisfying relationship with a woman. So when Violetta started flirting with him, he was a goner. And when she introduced him to her uncle Sasha, he became a KGB spy. Now you gotta realize that Marine security guards have unlimited access to our embassies, including the CIA spaces, the ambassador's office, and the communication center. A Marine security guard who goes bad can do devastating damage to our national security, especially in such important embassies as Moscow and Vienna. And I had these horrible images of KGB taps and other technical implants in our embassies in Moscow and Vienna. And we had no choice. We had to assume the worst case scenario. We simply couldn't trust Lone Tree to be telling us the whole, tr whole truth. So we called in CIA technical teams to go over the Vienna embassy with a fine tooth comb. We tore out all of our computers, all of our copiers, all of our communications equipment. We x-rayed the entire building. We completely disassembled the acoustically secure rooms. We spent millions of dollars doing that in Vienna. And I'm sure the cost in Moscow was even higher. Lone Tree, as we talked to him, seemed contrite. He wanted to redeem himself for what he had done by working for us as a double agent. That's why he approached me. He wanted to continue meeting with the KGB, but from now on, under our control. And as I point out in To Catch a Spy, I would normally have found that an appealing option, I would have ju jumped at the chance because I love double agent operations. In my book, in fact, I call double agent operations the caviar of counterintelligence because there's nothing in my opinion quite as delectable as a good juicy double agent operation. But we quickly had to rule that out in Moultrie's case for two reasons. First of all, he was so frightened and psychologically fragile that he could never play the role of a double agent convincingly. He could not be the good actor that would be required. And second, it became clear to us that Lone Tree was still very emotionally attached to Violetta. He kept insisting that theirs was true love. And he refused to believe that she had set him up. Even Lone Tree's partial admission that he had cooperated with the KGB was a confession of espionage. And once we determined that we would not use him as a double agent, we had no choice but to proceed with criminal prosecution. Lone Tree case was a huge scandal for the Marine Corps. 
There was speculation that our embassies had been penetrated by the KGB everywhere, especially in Moscow. I testified against Lone Tree at his court martial in Quantico, Virginia, at the U.S. Marine Base. Since I was still under cover, the court martial was closed to the public. Uh, I was allowed to testify in alias and disguise. Lone Tree was found guilty of espionage and sentenced to 30 years in prison. The Marine Corps threw the book at him. Some of you will remember the sensational publicity that surrounded the case. Next slide, please. The cover of Time Magazine had this picture of a U.S. Marine standing at attention in dress blues with this big black eye. Lone Tree did give the Marine Corps a big black eye. No Marine had ever been charged with espionage or treason before. The actual damage Lone Tree had done to our national security turned out to be minimal. There had been no technical penetrations of our embassies by the KGB. Lone Tree did give the KGB some classified information, some diagrams of our buildings, some documents that he took out of burn bags. It was bad, but it could have been a lot worse. Clay Lone Tree was a sad case. He shouldn't have been a Marine security guard in the first place. He should have been supervised more closely. He was a moody loner, heavy drinker, and an ardent admirer of Adolf Hitler. Now, wouldn't you have thought that that might raise some doubts about his suitability for the Marine security guard program? And the lesson learned here is that we must do a better job of screening our applicants for sensitive positions. In To Catch a Spy, I actually propose a new standard for screening people for government jobs, a standard I immodestly call the Olson axiom. When in doubt, keep them out. I wish we follow that axiom more closely today. The Marine Corps prosecutor and I petitioned the judge to grant clemency to Lone Tree on the basis of his remorse his cooperation in the damage assessment, the limited damage he caused, and his record as a model prisoner. Clayton Lone Tree was not a killer like Howard and Ames. Lone Tree was released after serving nine years of his sentence in 1996. And when he got out, what was the first thing he did? He sent a marriage proposal to Violetta. But she, not shockingly or surprisingly, had moved on. Aren't you amazed? But Lone Tree was heartbroken. And the last I heard, Lone Tree was working as a carpenter on a reservation in Arizona. And he insists to this day what, that what he and Violetta had was real. I don't find it in my heart to hate Clayton Lone Tree. He was not an evil person. He got in over his head. He betrayed our country, yes. But he admitted to his crime and he served his time without complaining. He paid for his crime. And if I could see Clayton Lone Tree today, I'd wish him well. Next slide, please. The best book on the Lone Tree case is this one, Dancing with the Devil by Rodney Barker. Sex espionage in the U.S. Marines, the Clayton Lone Tree story. Next slide, please. When Mary and I arrived in Vienna in 1981 for the first of our two assignments there, one of the first people we met was this person, the economic counselor at the embassy, Felix Block. Felix was charming, he was friendly, very witty. I was impressed by his knowledge of Austria and his high-level contacts in the Austrian government. Merit and I had frequent contact with Felix and his wife, Lou. We liked them. We considered them good company. We considered them friends. Felix was this old-school diplomat, very sophisticated and cultured, kind of European in his manner and dress, 
He always wore these ultra conservative three piece suits, a watch chain. He looked every bit the distinguished American diplomat we all thought he was. But as we all know, unfortunately, appearances can be deceiving. And none of us had any idea at the time that Felix Bloch, who later became our deputy chief of mission at the U.S. Embassy, was leading a triple life. First, Felix was a respected U.S. diplomat, a husband, father of two daughters, and a respected member of the international community. He was a pillar of the U.S. government establishment. Second, Felix was a sexual pervert. He was obsessed with sadomasochistic sex, and he frequented prostitutes in Vienna who were specialists of that kind of perversion. Felix had a sick need to be whipped, abused, degraded, humiliated, and punished by a dominating woman. Third, Felix Bach was a spy for the KGB. He had been sexually entrapped and recruited 15 years earlier when he was posted in Germany. And for all those years, 15 years and counting, he served his communist masters well by giving them top secret U.S. documents. For the last several years in Vienna, Felix had maintained a regular relationship with an Austrian prostitute named Tina. Next slide, please. Felix bought Tina an apartment in Vienna. He lavished her with money and gifts. In fact, we believe that all of the money the KGB paid Felix over the years was spent on his aberration sexually. We've been able to reconstruct how it worked. Felix came into the embassy on Saturday mornings when no one else was around. He copied the week's collection of top secret documents and intelligence reports. He loaded them into a bag. He left the embassy and dead dropped the bag to his KGB contact. And after doing that, he went immediately to Tina to be punished for what he had just done. Now, I'll spare you the details. But that was apparently enough psychologically to get him through the week so he could do it all over again the following Saturday. State Department drummed Felix out of the service, took away his pension. His marriage to Lou broke up. He's estranged from his two daughters. But he has never been prosecuted. And it was the FBI spy, Robert Hansen, another traitor, who told the KGB that Block was under suspicion, and as a result, Block was warned by the KGB to destroy everything and to clam up to get a lawyer, and we could not make the case against him. Felix was broke. He moved to North Carolina, got a job down there sacking groceries, but after a few months, he was caught shoplifting from his own store and was fired. As far as I know, Felix Block, former charge, deputy chief of mission of the U.S. Embassy in Vienna, is still living in North Carolina, a free man. And it galls me to no end that Felix Block is not paid for his crime. So there you have it, Edward Howard, Paul D. James, Clayton Longtree, and Felix Block, traitors I have known. Who was the worst in terms of pure evil? I would rank Ames first and then Howard. The most morally depraved was Phoenix Block. And what torments me, and it should torment every past and currently serving counterintelligence officer in the United States, is that traitors are still out there. We haven't caught them all. One of my favorite British authors, Rebecca West, next slide please, is right. In her classic book, The New Meaning of Treason, Rebecca West wrote this, only one-eighth of an iceberg, they say, appears above the water. The proportion of detected espionage to the whole 
is probably considerably less. Our job in counterintelligence, a very difficult job, is to go underwater and to blow up that hidden seven eights. Next slide, please. My good friend and former CIA colleague, Hank Crumpton, puts it this way in his book, The Art of Intelligence. Both Russia and China probably have more clandestine intelligence operatives inside the United States now, in the second decade of the 21st century, than at the height of the Cold War. Next slide, please. Hank is right. The end of the Cold War did not bring an end to treason against our country. In fact, the numbers are accelerating. Over 50 countries are known to be spying against us. And the worst culprit by far is China, followed by Russia, Cuba, Iran, and North Korea. But if you ask any counterintelligence specialist in the United States or anywhere in the West, what the number one counterintelligence concern is, the answer will be the same everywhere. China, China, China. If I could start my CI career all over again, and believe me, I'd love to. I tried to get into the CIA's China program. I learned Mandarin. I become a China counterintelligence expert. I can't do that. I can't roll back the clock. But I can do the next best thing. I can teach. I can teach the next generation of intelligence officers and spy catchers. Here's a dedication of my new book. Next slide, please. To my students at the Bush School of Government and Public Service of Texas A&M University, who inspire me every day with their dedication and commitment to serving our country. I can't imagine anybody could have a better second career than that. Next slide, please. Doug, I think it would be a good time to open up the floor if we still have time for any questions that the audience has, and I know you volunteered to screen and to moderate the questions. So over to you, Doug. Jim, let me, let me jump in real quick. Thank you very much for that really inspiring, insightful talk. Your passion for this space is very clear, and thank you for the service that you've given to the country. And what's really exciting, just like the Silver Foxes, you're still giving back. Yeah. And you're still trying to advance the cause. So thank you very much. Yeah. We'll ask Doug to uh, uh, moderate the, the Q&A session. We've had a couple come in. So, Doug, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you, Bill. And, and thank you, Jim. I, I echo Bill's comments. Thank you for your service and, and the great message here today. We do have a couple, as you might guess. The predominant question on everybody's mind here in Houston is, what's up with the closing of the Chinese embassy? Um, how do you think that ranks in terms of intelligence breaches that we might have previously experienced? My reaction to the closing of the Chinese consulate in Houston is, it's about time. We've known for years that the Chinese intelligence services are very active in Houston. And why wouldn't they be? It's the center of the oil and gas industry. It's the center of the space industry. It has research hospitals doing cutting edge work in several different areas. And we've caught the Chinese trying to steal those secrets across the board. And their intelligence operations in Houston are being run out of that consulate. Professional MSS and PLA officers operating there undercover. We should not give them that platform. We should not give them that free pass to operate in our own midst. And so I applied the United States government for taking it seriously. And I believe when the facts are out that it turned out that once again, just as they were last year, they're trying to steal medical technology. But it could be any kind of technology because the Chinese have an insatiable appetite for technology. 
and Houston is just one of the many places. I hope Houston will be a precedent for shutting them down elsewhere because what the Chinese intelligence services are doing in our country right now is outrageous. And if the American people truly understood how pervasive it was, how pernicious it was, how voracious their appetites are, they would be demanding action. And I hope now we're beginning to see some action and that we're taking this threat more seriously than we have in the past. So bravo, U.S. counterintelligence, FBI, White House, Congress, whoever was behind the decision to close the consulate in Houston. They're scrambling. They're frantic. What an image of them out in the courtyard burning their classified documents to hide their hand. But it's, it's an image that I'd like to see elsewhere. So related to that, Jim, um, how much should we as Americans and individual consumers be over the widespread and rampant deployment of technology on our applications that get put on our cell phones? There's been some news about the TikTok application being a Chinese implant. Right. Uh, even, even the Zoom platform we're using, there's some concerns about. Sure. Uh, what's your thoughts on that? Those are very well-placed concerns, Doug, because our technology makes us vulnerable. We all use it. There are things being used on our websites, in our electronic communications that are sensitive, that should not fall into the wrong hands. And the Chinese particularly, but other countries as well, have been particularly adept at exploiting that vulnerability. The Chinese... People's Liberation Army, PLA, has what they call information warfare centers all around China. And their mission is to hack into American communications and databases. And they're overwhelming us. Their sophistication, their attacks are so good that our defenses are not up to the challenge. We need to do a much better job of protecting that. I tell my students in my intelligence classes that if they are interested in a career in national security, they better be careful about what they post on social media. They better be careful about what they say on their cell phones because there's a good chance that the wrong people are, are listening. So it's a wake-up call for all of us. That technology gives us a lot of advantages, but it also can be a weakness that our adversaries are all too ready to take advantage of. What's your opinion of the relationship between Presidents Trump and Putin? Well, I've been concerned about that relationship. I thought that there were signs that it was too cozy, that there was too much trust, that there was too much cooperation. I first worked against Vladimir Putin when he was still a lieutenant colonel in the KGB in East Germany. And we knew already back then what he was. We knew already that Putin was a ruthless killer with absolutely no scruples. And I consider him even more dangerous today than he was back then. As I write in To Catch a Spy, I think it would be naive for anyone in the United States. It would be foolhardy for anyone in the United States, including the President of the United States, to think that it would be possible to have any kind of a good faith negotiation with Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Putin is a criminal. He is obsessed with the United States, and he wishes us no good. And so we need to be forewarned. This is a man we simply cannot trust. I think our President is becoming increasingly aware of the real nature of Putin. We're certainly feeding him in the intelligence community the truth about Putin. But the president has seen what he did in the Ukraine, what he's done in Syria, what he's doing with the Iranians, what he's done in Chechnya. This is a ruthless totalitarian dictator who simply cannot be trusted. That's my view of Putin. Did I make my views on Putin clear enough? <laughs> Tell us how you really feel, Jim. I don't like it. I don't like it. He's bad news. Uh, shifting gears a little bit, moving more domestically, there's a question 
George Soros is often considered to be behind much of the destructive domestic violence and riots. Is there any truth to that? And if it is, is what can be done about it? Well, I can't go into a lot of detail, and I certainly cannot accuse someone openly of criminal activity or seditious activity, but I've got absolutely no use whatsoever to George Soros and his kind. I think that even what we know of their activities is despicable. I think that their hatred for America guides their policies, their decisions, and billions of dollars are flowing into these organizations, these groups that want to bring down America. And I hope that we can somehow put a stop to that. But we do have a constitution. We do have a First Amendment. He is entitled to his views, whether they're as mistaken as I believe they are or not. But he is, I find, a hateful human being. And I have nothing but contempt for George Soros. Well, thank you for that. And again, going back to China, are the cybersecurity capabilities that the U.S. has, is it as good or better than China's? No. No. Our defensive cyber capabilities are not as good as China's offensive capabilities. They're beating us. And that's got to stop. There's no reason that America should not be the best in cyber. Our kids are on computers at three and four years old. They've grown up with computers. So the fact that we are being beaten by the Chinese and we are hemorrhaging so much data through hackers is unacceptable to me. We've got to change that. So the the answer is no. Uh, At the Bush School, we have expanded our, our cyber offerings because cyber is the future. I tell my students in my intelligence class, if you want a successful career in intelligence or any aspect of national security today, there are three things that you want to consider developing expertise in. First of all, you need to develop expertise in China because China is a threat. China is the long-term national security danger of the United States. Secondly, you want to develop expertise in money, financial intelligence. Because if you can get into the money flows of foreign intelligence services, of criminal organizations, of terrorist groups, you can bring them down. So financial intelligence is a big part of the future as well. But the third thing I tell them is you need to get into cyber. You need to develop a capability there because that's where we are draining our secrets, our technology. The magnitude of what we're losing through cyber attacks is far greater than what we're losing through human espionage or covert action. Mm. Cyber is the name of the game. If you know any young computer scientists out there who feel called to serve our country in a very meaningful, important way, who aren't primarily attracted by the higher salaries they can make in the private sector, please send them my way because we have a shortage. We can't recruit cyber people fast enough to meet the demands uh, that CIA has in that area. And this is across the board, the entire intelligence community, the military, uh, FBI. Uh, we need more cyber people because what we're doing now isn't enough. Mm. Okay. We, we have another question. Uh, do you think the Netflix series Americans where a Russian couple uh, posed as uh, Russian spies, posed as American travel agents with a whole family in the U.S. You think that's based on any particular real people or just an amalgamation of a story? I love the Americans. I watched it uh, from beginning to end. I recommend it to my students, anybody else that I talk to. The, the writer, the producer, Joe Weisberg, actually wrote a Jack of Blur for my book. We served together in the CIA. He's a good friend. I actually consulted with Joe on some of the plot lines for the Americans. And it's based on a real series of cases. And Joe gets it right. He understands the terminology. He understands the tradecraft. And illegals, Russian illegals in the United States posing Americans are a fact. And so I believe that that series is very well worth watching. 
it's reflective of what's really going on in the world of espionage. There are certain aspects of it, of course, that are Hollywoodized, sensationalized, but the essence of it, the drama of it, really is true to life. That's why I recommend it to everyone. It's available on Netflix. Start at the beginning. I think there have been six seasons. Once you start watching it, be careful. You'll be hooked. You won't be able to turn it off because it's, 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 it's something that, that really grabs you right from the beginning. And one of the things I like best about the, the Americans, and Merritt and I can relate to this because we lived it in the opposite direction, was the family dynamic. What this means to be a husband and wife spying couple, and also what it means to raising a family in that kind of uh, an environment. So, yeah, I'm glad somebody asked that because I think it's uh, a tip you can all take away. If you're looking for something to watch while you're hunkering down at home, uh, check out the, the Americans on Netflix. Yeah, I endorse that. That too. My wife and I are big fans. In fact, we've we've started watching it for a second time. Start to finish. <laughs> it, it's that good. Uh, Jim, do you, do you ever fear for your life? I wouldn't say I fear for my life, Doug. Um, but at the same token, can't be reckless. Can't ignore the fact that there are dangers out there. Merritt and I have never wanted to come up out from undercover. Uh, we wanted to retire undercover. Um, but when George Bush asked us to come down to Texas A&M to his new school, the Bush School, to begin developing a intelligence studies program, that was such an honor that we agreed that we would come down and do that, even knowing that it would meant that we would have to come out from undercover. Um, you cannot be on a college campus as covertly. And just as a simple matter, if I'm going to be teaching classes on intelligence, I've got to acknowledge that I have some experience in that area. Coming out from undercover has disadvantages. Your future travel is limited because what Meredith and I did overseas was a crime. Espionage is a crime everywhere. So if we travel to certain countries, we would be subject to arrest. We're not traveling to Russia anytime soon. I can tell you that. <laughs> and then the second, the second issue, and I don't want to over-dramatize this, is that when you come out from undercover and you acknowledge openly that you were former CIA, you attract a lot of kooks. There are some people out there who are obsessed with the CIA, who hate the CIA, particularly in this era of targeted killings by the CIA. So we've got to be careful. We need to be alert. Uh, I, I have concealed carry. Um, we get some help from the FBI and the CIA is necessary. And I can't go into much detail, but there have been a couple of incidents, even here in the safety, relative safety, you would think of College Station, Texas, where people who have learned about our presence down here and harass us, even make threats. It's unpleasant, but it's, uh, it's the cost of doing business. And we don't regret it at all coming out because it is such an honor it is such a privilege to be able to be here on this campus at the Bush School and to help these young men and women, these Aggies at Texas A&M, uh, find their own career path into intelligence, diplomacy, counterterrorism, all the things that we, we do at the Bush School. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, it's an absolutely unbeatable uh, second career. I feel blessed to be here. Mm -hmm. Well, again, I think on that note, I want to express our appreciation for your service and, and the sacrifices you've made, both as an individual and as a couple, to do that. Um, Bill, I think in the spirit of time here, I want to turn it back to you and let you uh, do our wrap-up. Yeah, let me do that. Uh, Jim, I'm inspired. I wish I could go back and go to A&M. Um, so thank you. thank you very much for your time. And today, and as we've all said, thank you much for your service. Yeah, most please, welcome. please continue to educate us, educate the young people, educate all of us. Um, we all want to believe life is pure, but honestly, we know better. And um, we don't want to be cynical, but we just need to be careful. Well, thank you very much. Yes, sir. Doug, if I could take you on to the next slide, please. Yes, sir. 
I wanted to highlight, I, I, I typically do this at the beginning, I'll do it real quick. I want to thank our sponsors. We talked a lot about what our programs are about. Um, and the richness of, of our lunch and learn speakers like today, as well as our education series. That happens really because we have some good sponsors, uh, Westwood being our biggest one, and they support us throughout the year. And uh, I'd ask you to, as one of my favorite TV uh, radio shows says, please support them because they support us. And uh, if you go on to the next slide, not actually go quickly, yeah, they used to. These are also two others. They're actually members, but they, they give a lot of time through their firms uh, to help us succeed. So we call them in kind, but truthfully, we couldn't get a lot of things done without these two organizations. Um, the accounting organization, Griffin and Company, and kind of the marketing slash PR group, Pierpont. And both of them provide a lot of insight for us. So again, please support them as, as your needs arise. Next month, we're going to have an interesting talk. It's, it's an evolving field uh, in sports. It's, 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 it's really understanding the electronic world that is going to run parallel to the sporting world. And we're very excited to have Kent with us. Um, it's going to talk a lot about the technology that, that, that we just talked about. And so we invite you to join us on August 27th. We will be sending out notices of how to register for that, for that talk. Uh, most likely we will stay in this virtual mode and uh, be here for a couple more months. But uh, I think we're gonna have a re another really interesting talk next month. So I invite you to join us, look, look for the invite and register. And I, I'm gonna go ahead and shut down now and say thank you very much for your time. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for supporting the Silver Foxes and uh, if we can help you in any way, I've highlighted our website down here at the bottom of this page. Please uh, visit our website. There's multiple ways to contact us, and we would be more than happy to help you. With that, I would say good day, and uh, stay safe.